Good evening, I'm Valentine Cass, recently retired from the National Science Foundation, and I'm very pleased to let everyone know that the Antarctic Artists and Writers Program, which was suspended through the pandemic, uh, is in the process of being reinstituted. From here on out, it will be uh, managed by the, uh, in cooperation with the National Science Foundation by Oregon State University which has just launched its new um, website just as of last week. So you can find out more information about the Antarctic Artists and Writers Program and also the Polar Educators Program at polarsteamed.info. And I'll be very happy to talk with people during the reception as well. Thank you. Valentine, thank you. <laughs> Valentine, I just wanna say thank you for your, your creativity and your leadership in that project, and uh, everybody please do find time to congratulate her on her recent retirement. So. <laughs> Let's go back over here. Good evening, I'm Julie Yell. I'm a research faculty member at the University of Maryland, and uh, my project is that I have written a book that was published a year and a half ago by New Degree Press on innovations at the intersection of the arts and the sciences, featuring collaborations very similar to the one that I look forward to hearing about tonight. Uh, I recently got an email from the University of Maryland um, call for submissions proposing curriculum for an undergraduate seminar on the arts and the sciences. I'm thinking of tossing my hat into the ring, so if you have any thoughts on how to um, take some of the great work that people are doing and turn it into a curriculum, that's um, the proposal is due in mid-February. Um, and even if I don't make that deadline, I'm just interested in heading in that direction generally. So please come and find me. Thank you. Over here. Hi, my name is Genevieve Alotepapo. I'm a fifth year PhD candidate at Princeton University. I'm in the music department. I'm an ethnomusicologist and composer, and I'm here with the Creative Arts and Public Humanities cohort at Princeton University. Um, looking forward to talking to um, anyone who wants to talk to a composer or an ethnomusicologist. Thank you. Can I just, thank you. Can, can I just ask everybody who's visiting from Princeton, can you stand up? 
Good. Welcome. Thank you. Over here. Good evening. Uh, my name is Smita Vishweshwara, and I'm a quantum physicist from Illinois who loves studying nature from the atomic to the astronomical scales. And also, I love collaborating um, with artists on uh, who we are and our place um, in the cosmos through dance, music, theater. And we've created pieces called Quantum Voyages, Joy of Regathering, and so on. And the latest upcoming one is a circus performance um, in Las Vegas. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, what is it called? Uh, we gave it a name. Cosmic Tumbles Quantum Leaps. <laughs> and it's at our largest annual physics um, meeting. And I happen to be here uh, with the American Physical Society for um, a meeting. And I'm just so thrilled that it coincided with this fabulous Taser event. Thank you. That's wonderful. It's It's wonderful to meet you in person. We've had so many exchanges on Zoom, like so many things, so it's nice to have a human connection again. Thank you for being here. Back over here. Hi. Um, my name is Dylan Blau Edelstein. I'm also with the Princeton group that's here. I'm a third year in the Spanish and Portuguese department there, um, and my research has to do mostly with historical intersections between psychiatry and the arts world. And so I've been doing a lot of work for a while about the biography of this important Brazilian art therapist named Nisi da Silveira. Um, there was a really good movie about her done a couple years ago called Nisi, Heart of Darkness, if anyone is interested. Um, and more broadly, I'm just interested in the ways that um, the arts world and the way that psychiatry has been um, represented in media and in the arts has affected the ways that people approach their mental health care. So yeah, so happy to be here and maybe I'll find someone else who works on similar things. <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Patrick Warfield and I have the pleasure of directing the Presidential Arts Initiative at the University of Maryland, one of the goals of which is to bring the arts, science, and technology into a more robust dialogue, and we're delighted to have Professor Cy Keener up on our stage. And I'd like to invite all of you to please visit arts.umd.edu and come join us in College Park for some of our exciting programming. Thank you so much for sharing that. And back over here. Hi, I'm Jefferson Beck. I'm an earth science video producer at NASA Goddard, where we do a lot of research into the cryosphere. And, um, among some other projects, like a VR project of flying low over Alaskan glaciers, I have a 48-foot print of the calving front of the massive Helheim Glacier taken on a NASA <clears throat> Operation Icebridge flight with uh, John Woods, perhaps, who was on stage there. And uh, that print is freely available to anybody who wants it for a, for a gallery show, a science exhibition, a dance party, uh, whatever you need. So. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Shanti Chandrasekhar, and I'm a multimedia, multidisciplinary artist, and a lot of my work is uh, inspired by science, all phase, neuroscience, physics, cosmology. And uh, I recently got uh, selected as uh, Kennedy Center's The Reach Culture Caucus member, and it gives me an opportunity to put together uh, programming and one of the first ones that I'm going to be starting out with is uh, in a discussion presentation of the intersections of art and science on April 25th from 6 to 9 p.m. So if you're interested in learning about, um, you know, or like the local artists and scientists and institutes, including CPNAS, uh, are going to be part of this. So I welcome all of you to join in and check out the Kennedy Center's programming for this event. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Michael Feldman, the founder of the Theater and Policy Salon. I've been in advising on a script uh, for a play called uh, Ocean Filibuster that was done in cooperation with 
the Harvard Center on the Environment. We're doing a series of panel discussions in connection with Wesleyan University uh, this spring on art, science, ocean conservation, and climate change, and I'd love to uh, see about co-promoting some of these panel sessions, which will be live streamed. Thanks, good to see you again. Thank you, thanks for coming. Hi, I guess I'm shorter than the last people here. I'm Roseanne Weiss. You can actually lower that down, I think, a little bit if you need to, maybe by the handle, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm Roseanne Weissman, uh, a wildlife children's book author and photographer. Uh, in November, I was at the edge of the Arctic to see polar bears, and I'm doing a book on that. So I did a few exciting things that I'd never done before, dog sled riding and helicopter riding to a polar bear den to see the inside of a polar bear den. Um, my first book, and only book at this point, is Roseanne travels to Africa to kiss a giraffe. And so people kidded me and said, so is your next one going to be about kissing a polar bear? And I said, if it were, all you would see is a little scrap of purple fabric in the polar bear's mouth. So this was very interesting. My first time in the kind of subarctic, first time seeing polar bears and the other animals of that area, such as an Arctic hare and an Arctic fox, et cetera. Great. I, I, think our, I think our panelists may have some polar bear stories that we'll share later. Over here. Hello, my name's Larry Minert, retired from the United States Geological Survey. And a few years back, I did a project following Charles Darwin's voyage of the Beagle. Most people know him as an evolutionary biologist. And in fact, you could probably call him one of the world's first geologists. And so what I did was actually take his writings with me on a ship as we stopped at all the places he stopped, recreated what he saw, and explored it in terms of modern geology. That was all presented in a three-dimensional multimedia art music presentation for which my biggest challenge was finding out how to get it documented in the library. Thank you. Thank you, and our <laughs> thanks for being here. And our last one. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Martina Timba. I'm a freshman at George Washington. I'm majoring in biology pre-med with a focus in molecular and cellular, and then I'm minoring in public health and psychology, and I'm micro minoring in health equity. Um, <laughs> I just want to come up here and say hi. I'm also here with the Women's Leadership Program. I'm in the Science, Health, and Medicine cohort. And I hope to be a pediatric oncologist, so if anyone here has any um, knowledge in the field of oncology, I'd love to speak with you. And um, I'm looking forward to this discussion, so thank you. Fantastic. So, so as you can tell, the, there's just as much creativity in, this, in the audience as there is on, on the stage, and I just think this is an amazing space to be in. So thank you for sharing. Uh, use this opportunity to network during the reception uh, afterwards. And uh, with no further ado, let's, let's move forward. Um, tonight's Dazer is organized around uh, a current exhibit, which we've already heard mentioned a few times uh, from, from members of the audience. Uh, the exhibit is entitled Arctic Ice, a Visual Archive. And this exhibit is a result of a unique collaboration between different ways of knowing and I think it illuminates the potential of this type of, of dialogue that span across the disciplines. And we have with us on stage uh, four members of this collaboration, and as you've already seen, uh, not, not everyone by any means, uh, but our, our core collaborators are Cy Keener, uh, who is sitting to my right, uh, artist and assistant professor of sculpture and emerging technology at the University of Maryland, College Park, and next to Sai is Justine Holzman, who is a landscape researcher and historian of science PhD uh, student at Princeton University. Prin Princeton University, yeah, okay. You gotta make sure everybody's awake back there. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Ignatius Rigger, who is a climatologist at the Polar Science Center Applied Physics Laboratory and affiliate associate assistant professor at the School of Oceanography at the University of Washington in Seattle. And John Woods. John is a retired U.S. Navy meteorology and oceanography officer and current deputy director for the U.S. Navy International Engagements 
here in Washington, D.C. Please give our panelists a, a warm welcome. Sai, would you like to kick us off? Sure. I would, I would like to start with some thank yous. So um, thanks to everyone for being here. It's really great to see all of these folks. Um, I was at maybe one of the last Dazers before the, the pandemic, so it's kind of fun to be back here in person. And um, I think thanks to JD on two counts. Um, one is that I don't think he quite bargained for it at the time, but he actually helped originate the show that's upstairs. So J JD and I started corresponding, I looked it up today, in February of, of uh, 2019. And um, the work that you see up there is the culmination of effort by everyone here, um, plus some members in the audience. And uh, it was mostly made over the summer. Um, and so I think just thanks to JD for um, having confidence in us <laughs> to, to make that new work and, and to deliver that show. And, uh, and thanks to him for having us all here. I don't think that there are that many venues that welcome a diverse <laughs> set of speakers like this or are excited to hear, hear our story. So um, thanks so much for, for giving us this platform to kind of share what we've been up to. Um, and then a little note on the format. So, uh, I think in the typical format, we kind of go by speaker. And then in this, uh, for tonight, we decided to try to tell the story of uh, the two kind of halves of the exhibition. So the first, um, sort of the first half of our talk will be talking about sea ice, uh, which leads to the sea ice daily drawing. So that's the, the works on the left if you come up the stairs from here. And then the next part of the talk will be about the iceberg um, portraits. And so I'm going to do a quick intro, I guess, to, I, I thought a fun way of kicking this off would be to talk about <clears throat> what Justine and I were doing before we met Ignatius and John. Um, so I think that the, the word artist can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I'm just going to quickly show you, this was an a installation um, that I did in 2010, and the whole idea of the installation was to make a glacial cave. So um, we would bring 2,500 pounds of ice into this uh, kind of skylight area uh, at the beginning of each week, and then that ice would melt and kind of run down the walls. So this was me kind of before I knew electronics or coding or <laughs> sensors, <laughs> trying to kind of get at some similar ideas. Um, and then these are, I'm going to show just a couple of seconds of some videos of, of two different projects when I started learning how to do sensors and electronics. So this one, there were 30 of these bird-shaped sensors in a field that were sensing wind direction independently. And then they fed to this wall of lights that where the light, each ind individual light would face towards the direction of the wind from that one sensor. Uh, and then the other piece, which kind of gets us closer to, to the work here, uh, is that I did some different, um, a bunch of different iterations of making my own ocean buoys. And I did not, these were not prepared for the cold whatsoever, but they were um, ocean buoys with the idea of sensing the wave motion and then being able to have a room that uh, people could go to to experience the, the kind of mood of the ocean. And um, Justine <laughs> is, uh, when I met her in uh, 2017, and she was an assistant professor of landscape architecture at the University of Toronto. Uh, and then she had co-authored this book, Responsive Landscapes, which you see here, uh, which looks at how artists and designers are thinking about environmental monitoring and incorporating it into their design work and practice. And um, she's also contributed a body of interdisciplinary research with designers, engineers, and scientists to address environmental issues and climate change in coastal and fluvial environments. So she did a bunch of work with the Army Corps of Engineers on trying to do smarter um, sea level rise resilience and different efforts. And then we actually met on a project that had to do with trying to design uh, you can't really say the word solutions with sea level rise, but <laughs> you design um, different 
kind of more adventurous um, responses to sea level rise in the Bay Area. So these are just some drawings that were created from that. And our job was to deploy sensors in these um, canals and rivers that were bringing um, fresh water down to the bay and try to look at them as ways of increasing resilience. So I think art can mean a lot of different things, but this is just a, a little bit of where we were coming from before we started working with John and Ignatius. So I was uh, charged to talk about Arctic sea ice. Volume good? There we go. Okay, so I was charged to talk about Arctic sea ice, um, and I should thank JD and Sai for bringing us here. Um, it's been fun to work with Sai because it's you know he adds a whole new dimension to our research and outreach, um, which we'll show more through this through the rest of the night. Um, but yeah, so a lot of what we know about Arctic sea ice and Arctic climate in general is from observations from the Arctic Buoy Program. And coincidentally, this is a program that was recommended by the National Academy of Engineering, Science and Engineering, back in 1974. And it's nice to see this program circle back another time to the National Academies. Um, but back in 1974, there was a big uh, boom in electronics to build weather stations and deploy them in remote places across the Arctic Ocean. NOAA also um, sent up a couple satellites that will help us collect the data from these remote locations and transmit it back to our offices. Um, with these two events, they wanted to build a long-term development of weather stations across the global oceans. And back then, the funding model was to have the Office of Naval Research, National Science Foundation, NOAA, um, could all contribute to this network that we all need. Um, and interestingly enough, 40 years later, we have pretty much the same funding model and um, interagency support. We now include uh, the Coast Guard and NASA, Department of Energy, and also the North Slope Borough for the Arctic Buoy Program. This, um, this animation is just gonna show 40 years, over 40 years of buoy data in 17 seconds. The red dots are where the buoys were reporting at the time. Alaska's on the lower, lower left. Um, Siberia and Russia are on the upper left. And then Europe and Norway are on the upper right. And then Greenland um, is on the lower right. The North Pole is roughly in the middle of the map. The buoys are overlaid on satellite data from passive microwave. Um, so let me start this animation. And you can see a lot of things. You know, the buoys drift pretty quickly across the Arctic Ocean. Residence time is typically a few years. Um, in the early part of the record, we had about 25 buoys reporting at any given time. And more recently, we've been able to up that number to over a couple hundred um, with the help of the International Polar Years. Um, and we were able to maintain the network, you know, about that, at about that level now. Um, the weather, the data is used for a lot of different things. Um, just to, you know, some of it's listed here. You know, the big ones, the weather forecast. All the buoys and weather station data gets into the weather forecast from the National Weather Service. Um, it's used to validate satellites from NASA. Um, a lot of reasons. Um, you know, and also research into climate change. And so, some a lot of the first indications of Arctic climate change were observed using data from the buoy program. So in this case, a paper by John Walsh back in 1996 looked at the first 16 years of data and these maps of air pressure over the Arctic Ocean. If you just look at the difference between the two, you see a big decrease in air pressure over the ocean. And since the gradient in air pressure drives the winds, um, this implied a significant change in the wind patterns and the advection of heat and moisture into the Arctic Ocean. Similarly, the, there was a paper by Rigger et al. in 2002 which showed how global warming is impacting the Arctic. Um, these just show the seasonal maps of 
warming. Um, it's warmest in the spring when all the ice is melting out. Um, during the summer, the Arctic is still an ice bath, and so there's enough ice there to hold the temperatures to the melting point of sea ice. Um, but you know, the global warming signal that we see throughout the globe is you know, amplified in the Arctic. And so here's the global warming signal. Without data from buoys on the oceans and weather stations on land, we would not be able to make this estimate. But as we all know, there's a trend in the temperatures over the Arctic Ocean related to our impact on the planet. And so with global warming, we see a thinning of Arctic sea ice. In this case, I'm showing the age of sea ice estimated from the buoy drift. Basically, we know how long the buoys have been out there, um, what the temperatures are, how they've moved, and from that, we can estimate how long that ice has been there. Um, and so if you watch this, you see the white stuff is ice that's been around for at least 10 years old. The blue stuff is younger, thinner ice of just a few years. The darker blue is open ocean and young sea ice. But you see in the late 90s, a big warming and flushing event of a lot of the ice out of the Arctic Ocean. And so now, you know, with positive feedbacks of the thinner ice circulating back to the coastal areas, the melt of sea ice is accelerating. And so now we're left with a very thin veneer of sea ice, much thinner than it was before. Back in the areas when we had a lot of older 10-year-old ice, this ice could be over 10 years, or five meters thick on average, but now it's you know, one to two meters thick and there's only a small area of older, thicker sea ice. Um, north of the Canadian archipelago, which is on the bottom part of the map. And so this is a big problem because sea ice um, provides the base of the food chain. Ice algae is, uh, grows at the bottom and this uh, trickles up and feeds um, humans and polar bears on the Arctic Ocean. And so the loss of sea ice impacts a lot of species, and this is one of the reasons why polar bears were listed as an endangered species. Basically, all the older, thicker sea ice that's north of Alaska, or was north of Alaska, is gone, and your, your preferred habitat has decreased a very small patch north of the Canadian archipelago. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm not a PhD scientist. I'm not an artist. I'm definitely not an engineer. But I wanted to start out with kind of a, a nostalgic throwback memory lane when I was a, an instructor at the U.S. Naval Academy and just show you what kind of uh, goes into a kind of an Arctic buoy build and then eventually a deployment. Uh, so what you're looking at here kind of going from left to right across the top and then again across the bottom is uh, this is a buoy hull that's, that's made for the Arctic. It's probably about 350 pounds or so. It's very thick uh, composite material built by this professional boat builder. And uh, it's meant to actually be thrown out of the back of a C-130. So you push it out of the back of a cargo military plane. It has an, a uh, parachute that sometimes open and sometimes doesn't. Even when the parachute doesn't open, the thing still works. So it's like the tank of Arctic buoys. But um, what we decided was to do a student project with it. And that's what you see. These are you know, student Naval Academy midshipmen in, in, a, in a tank, you know, testing the buoyancy of it, building the electronics on it. Sai has since replaced them and is much more reliable. Uh, but we actually got this thing to, to float. This is in the Severn River down uh, in Annapolis. You ship it up into a box. You, you pray a couple weeks later that it shows up in Barrow, Alaska, which is the northernmost town in the U.S. You bring your students up there on a spring break trip, which they loved, which was pretty awesome. So there you see the same students outside these little huts that we lived in. You throw them on snow machines to go cruising around the ice. You can see them on the upper right there. Uh, uh, riding up one of these sleds that are made to be dragged behind a snow machine with their coveted buoy on it. And then you go out in the sea ice and you deploy it. The ironic story of this one is that we didn't leave it on the sea ice. We actually put it back in the same box and it uh, ended up on the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Healy, one of our few icebreakers that we have. And it was eventually deployed out in the Arctic Ocean. So that's sort of the, the, the lifestyle of a, kind of an idea, a build, kind of research and development to an actual deployment to go collect data. So this was the final, actually, picture that we have of the buoy. It got, uh, again, hoisted off the back of a Coast Guard cutter. And then the tracks, like you just saw from Ignatius, 
is where this buoy went, kind of the, the yellowish is where it started. I think those are months. And then it actually ended up over in Russian territory, which I'm sure they were thrilled to see this <laughs> US Navy uh, stickers all over it buoy uh, show up on, on their shoreline. So, but uh, it was a pretty cool experience. So I was brought here to talk about sort of the logistics and I, I can't take credit for this slide. Well, I made this one from the Canadian Space Agency, but uh, I heard this one from, from a National Science Foundation uh, logistics manager for the U.S. Antarctic program. And they, they love to brag that it's easier to get equipment and gear and supplies to the International Space Station, which is 400 kilometers straight up, than it is to the polar regions. So here it is to Utkiavik, uh, which Utkiavik is one of the easier places for us to go. But you can see that the time distance scale is much different uh, trying to get to the polar regions as compared to directly up in space. Uh, I love to steal George Newton, those with a Navy background, uh, especially a submarine background, probably uh, have heard of him. He was a uh, presidential appointee to the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. He served three terms. He's a retired Navy submarine captain. He was the founder of this science experiment that the submarine force still considers. And these are his five rules of Arctic research. And, and if you've been to the Arctic, you, you definitely know that they're true. Nothing ever works the same. Your iPhone that lasts for 11, 12 hours here, you take it out at minus 40 and it's dead in about 90 seconds and it just drains, <laughs> which is uh, you know, great when you're trying to take photos and, and think that you're gonna document your trip. Uh, you should always buy a round trip ticket. I'll talk about going to Greenland. Uh, we've, we come into that. Never miss a meal. I don't miss many meals, but when you're in a field camp, it's really like the food is outstanding because they want to keep you happy and you're burning a ton of calories just from trying to keep your body warm. Never give up a reservation south, so there's no chivalry. Uh, if you have a flight to go south and your poor friend doesn't, you say goodbye to him or her <laughs> and uh, you hope you see him again when you get back home. And uh, this is the best one because especially in the Pentagon where I work now, you have all these policy experts, you'll have you know, congressional visits up to the Arctic region. They go up there once, they're instant Arctic experts. George said, you know, you're an Arctic expert, one that went there once, they think they are, and then you're no longer an expert until you've been up there 20 times. So Ignatius and I, we've been going to the Arctic for over a decade now. Sai has spent over 20 days in the Arctic, so Sai, we're blessing you now with, a, with an Arct as an Arctic expert as well. Justine's coming with us, we'll just, we won't give you a round, a round trip ticket, so you'll be stuck there for 20 days. Um, so how I met Sai, which is great, I, I think he is the only like LinkedIn uh, connection I've ever made that actually like went somewhere. So <laughs> he, he reached out to me on LinkedIn, I responded, I saw his message, and I was actually working at the National Ice Center at the time, and he just said, hey, I'm, I wanna build, I wanna visualize the Arctic. And uh, we got him to a meeting, I, I, the timing might be off here, but this was one of your exhibits, I don't think he showed it yet, of the, the sea ice kind of uh, light thing, which was pretty awesome. Uh, and I don't know the exact time, but it was something like, you know, seven or eight months from meeting him to there he is up in Alaska, you know, putting together his little widgets uh, in, in Barrow or Ukiavik, Alaska. Uh, you might notice the, the guy in the middle there, that's actually Al Roker. We brought the Today Show up to Ukiavik, which was a, a whole nother uh, expedition. But there's Sai interviewing with one of his, uh, his buoys there. And then during the global pandemic, this was one of the last photos pre-COVID in the middle of Sai teaching this, this group of sea cadets that we had on, on an Arctic buoy program or project. And then you might recognize Justine in the exhibit that was up in Rockville uh, a couple of years ago. So a little, you know, a great relationship building and, and, you know, I think it really rounded out the team. Um, this, I just wanted to hit play. So just, the Arctic is not flat. It's not just this flat expanse white. This is actually the Arctic Ocean. You can see sea ice, that's all sea ice, frozen ocean there. Those cracks are open ocean. It's minus 20 probably in this, in this video. We're in a helicopter flying out. Um, you can see just north of Barrow, Alaska. And there's Sarah who got up earlier out deploying some buoys for us. This is a time lapse of drilling holes in the ice to allow size instruments to go down through the ice, uh, which was a, a great experience. And uh, this is how you, know, you get up there to deliver his, his uh, instrument to go collect the data that you see visualized here tonight. So uh, 
one other last kind of anecdote about the Arctic. Uh, this is another one of my colleagues, Jackie Richter Menge, who recently retired from the Army after a great career. Is once you go to the Arctic, you just want to get back. It kind of gives you that bug. So I highly recommend anyone uh, that, that is interested in this area to try to get up there. It is a, it is a fascinating environment. So there's size instrument going down through a hole that we just drilled into the sea ice. This is the light sensor, right, that's collecting the data for, for one of the earlier projects. It's really important to, to see this sensor when you go and look at the exhibit upstairs yep. because it's directly related to it. So. Yep. And this is the, the change in, in light going kind of through the sea ice uh, from the surface down uh, into the water eventually. All right, and uh, this kind of a cool, actually, Ganesh, I'll let you explain this, the, the kind of buoy tracks. You can see the, the yellow dots there on the right. Yeah, so um, you know, we get these flights from the North Slope Borough uh, Search and Rescue. That's a Search and Rescue helicopter in the back. It's the most beautiful helicopter I've ever been on. Um, and we could actually pack quite a bit into it. This is, I think this is an, uh, what's the military version of this thing? Skorsky. Uh, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's a wonderful vehicle, but you know, we'll, we'll pack 12 buoys onto this plane and deploy them along a line uh, flying out from Barrow, and we'll deploy different types. But at the big cluster at the farthest point, you know, we put one of size buoys out there, a webcam so we could see what's happening, um, and a couple other weather stations. And we also did some wooden boats, which is part of our outreach project, one of our outreach projects, basically kids in Seattle and Colorado, Iceland, Italy, decorate these boats and we kind of sneak some science on them. Um, yeah, um, you know, we learned a lot from this data. Uh, you know, just in that short snippet of tracks, you can see differences in how they flow and a lot of this is related to how big the, um, how big of a flow we put them on. This animation shows, you know, I talked about how there's a thin veneer of sea ice. It's, it's more prone to crack now. Just the slightest changes in wind will crack all the ice. Um, and this is one of the responses of Arctic sea ice to global warming and climate change. The atmosphere will invect a lot of, carry a lot of heat to the Arctic and radiate it out to space, but a bigger amount of heat is carried by the ocean to the Arctic. Um, it's a ability to crack allows more heat to, to be uh, released to the atmosphere and then out to space to help cool the planet. But yeah, it's a pretty dynamic, um, system, more dynamic system now. We're, we're, we're just, you know, this happens almost every year. And this is our group photo of, uh, of one of our days. And this was during the Bernie craze with the mittens, so. <laughs> but I just wanted to show um, the diverse group. Bernie was not there with us, but, uh, <laughs> you know, from, you know, US DOD to academia to government, uh, the local community, so we had bear guards. You actually have to, you know, uh, contract with the local locals to come out in the ice with you to protect you from polar bears, which is a, a great asset. And, uh, <laughs> and again. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's wonderful what you learn from these guys because they've grown up on the sea ice. It's the wealth of knowledge they have. And, you know, it's just fun to go out there because they'll point things out that I never realized. You know, they'll do things and I'll stop and say, why are you putting snow in that crack? And he's like, well, if we come back and that snow's lower, the ice is on the move and we should get on the other side. So it's, you know, just a lot of little tidbits like that. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful experience. This is, this is back to me for just a couple of minutes, but the, the kind of wonderful um, thing about the, I guess what I, I get to do as an artist is that I get to be responsible for both the data collection and the, um, the data presentation. Uh, so this is just a little bit of background on these instruments um, that Justine and I have been working on for a while. So that first one, sorry, the, my first foray, I actually used like a handmade um, shell. Like I turned the, the, this thing on a lathe and then made these resin castings. And I launched these from Hawaii because that was much more accessible than the Arctic. Um, but it was kind of my first adventure. And, and then I also uh, spent some time working uh, 
on the idea of making more sustainable or just kind of more uh, friendly materials for the ocean. So all of these things that, that we're referring to as buoys tonight are mostly sort of a one-way instrument. So they, um, because you can't really tether anything to the Arctic Ocean and then have the ice come through. So uh, these were some blown glass uh, and aluminum, different versions of the buoys that I experimented with. Uh, and then there's a whole kind of technical side that I don't, <laughs> I guess I, I've sort of stopped working on a little bit with the um, the pandemic and all of the microchip shortages, but I actually um, designed the electronics to go inside of the buoys. Uh, so that's with uh, this technology called Arduino. So there's this whole community of open source hardware and software out there. And then these are some kind of different levels of the design and kind of thought that goes into making that chunk of electronics that basically has to, um, sleep most of the time and not really use much energy because it's all battery powered and then it has to wake up, take some measurements and then send that data by satellite. Um, so that's kind of the function of that. And then another collaborator who's not here is Dave Ellenberg. Uh, Dave is my uncle and I'm super fortunate that he is a retired C programmer and he's probably put in about 2000 hours <laughs> in the last six years sort of maintaining the C code that, um, that runs these things. and responding when we want to have a, add a new sensor or do some new capability. Uh, and then this is the instrument. So there's sort of the brain um, that's in all of the buoys and that does GPS location, barometric pressure, because that's what Ignatius wants for um, the weather models and then a, a temperature, like an exterior temperature. But then for the drawings that are upstairs, then this is a uh, instrument made by this creation company called Brunson that Ignatius introduced me to, and so it's a, basically this string that was that John was showing. But that's this uh, 3.2 meter string that we basically put through the ice. Um, so that's what actually is used. Each one of those um, color strips upstairs is one reading um, from that string. So, um, and then on that string there is. Uh, there's actually two of them. One does the temperature every two centimeters, and then one does a uh, red, green, blue color every five centimeters. And then this is a, a kind of seasonal map um, put together showing the orange is the ocean, so that's always the same temperature, and then the um, color of the surface is um, red being warm and blue being cold, and then the green is the ice kind of growing. Justine and I thought that we would get this perfect graph for the first time that we used the sensor by only deploying, deploying one of them, <laughs> which was pure fantasy. But, but, um, but then part of the, the thing that we get to do as designers is to have fun with the actual design of it. So um, this was a collaborative thing that, that we did for this first buoy of trying to um, make it have this, I don't know, I just wanted it to have this like some sort of shape that was not standard. <laughs> so we worked super hard to try to get these, these ripples and these kind of fine um, texture on it. And then it has a battery and electronics inside. And then this is a kind of deployed condition. And then this is a, on the left is a, a just kind of graphic of how this thing would be deployed. And then on the right is actually a plot of the data. And I think I'll just show this for two seconds, but the, this is the temperature line here. So this is, this is the air. So you have the kind of, I guess in this case, then the air is sort of, um, it looks like it's around zero. And then this, the ocean tends to be around, I guess the air must be colder, it must be minus 20 or something like that. But then the temperature in the ocean is always the same around like minus 1.8. And then this is the profile through the ice. And then these are the red, green, blue plots. So you can see that the light diminishes as it goes down through. Um, and then the yellow is actually like a total um, amount of light. So that's the a kind of plot of the data that we're um, working with. Yeah, so while the design of the sensor was coming together, um, Sai and I were already envisioning an art installation for a gallery at VizArts, um, just outside of DC. It was a really interesting long and narrow window display. Um, the, uh, on a space on a street with a really large amount of passing commuter traffic. And so we imagined an iteration that could be read from two different vantage points, um, 
by car from the street. It could be read almost like a time-based graph. This is this graph that we sort of <laughs> imagined would, would perfectly fade off into the distance. Um, and from the sidewalk, you could read the data text embedded within the drawings. So each um, drawing represents one day of data. They were made using a software called Proce uh, Processing, a code-based drawing program where we could use the same code to generate individual drawings specific to the daily transmits of data. Um, so this allowed us to make a really coherent series of drawings with the data itself as a key component for constructing them. We hung this installation as we received the data, um, building up a timeline of the sea ice as it intersected with the limb buoy deployed in the Arctic. For our current installation here at NAS, um, we designed the new works um, with the gallery space in mind. At this time, we had compiled several years of sea ice data, and our thinking shifted from a real-time kind of representation to that of an archive. We opted for a more permanent set of materials and method of display. Um, what you see here is a custom aluminum frame that we built to hold the drawings printed on a thicker material, um, kind of composed in weekly sets of seven days held at 45 degree angles. And so we produce about 70, or exactly 70 individual days of data hung in 10 aluminum frames from three different years. So each daily drawing preserved the the, the scale of the ice, um, which is to say the length of the drawing is the same length as that sensor, ship, uh, sensor strip that um, Sai, Sai showed. So um, from afar, you can see the color of the RGB values. Um, moving closer to the work, so you can read the RGB and the temperature data in text form um, from its corresponding location on the sensor. Um, so the colors are quite different from different years of, of data collection. Um, you can see that here, and this goes to some of the algae um, within the ice that Ignatius mentioned. Um, and so behind the daily drawings are sheets of archival paper. We wanted to include a, a kind of another layer of information that related to the sea ice. Um, and so at the bottom, we recorded the longitude and latitude from the buoy's position from that day of, of transmit. We drew a line at the point um, that divides the ocean water from um, the ice based on a temperature reading. We used analyses from the National Ice Center to give an overall kind of measurement of the sea ice extent across the full Arctic, like the animation that Ignatia showed. Um, and at the top of, of the drawing, um, when it was available on certain days, a measure of carbon in the atmosphere from the closest NOAA measuring station, which where um, that location is actually where the, te the team is basing their field work from. And so our hope is that this installation makes it possible to experience the variation of sea ice um, true to its actual scale in the Arctic. And so from here, we'll actually um, switch locations and artwork, and we'll hand it back to Ignatius. Yeah, so one of the scariest things about climate change is sea level rise. And so if you look at Greenland, the Greenland ice sheet, and Antarctica, there's meters of sea level rise that can potentially happen if this all melts. And so that's one of the motivations for this uh, iceberg tagging experiment was to go to, um, go to Greenland and you know, get more data about icebergs. Uh, the chart on the right shows the typical area of melt um, over Greenland. Typically it's about 100 square kilometers of Greenland that melts each year. Um, this varies from 100 square kilometers in a, during a cold summer to 500 square kilometers during a warm summer. The orange line is 2012, which was the warmest, uh, the most melt we've seen on Greenland, but also for the Arctic sea ice, that's when we lost most of the ice. Um, and if the blue line is 2020, the most recent data that we have um, available, readily available on the, on the web. Um, it's not as warm as 2012 was, but if you just look at the last 10 years, you know these are the warmest years and the largest areas of uh, Greenland that have been melting. The map of Greenland on the right shows the changes in the height of the ice sheet. So blue is areas where the height is actually increasing, and this is due to more snowfall onto the ice sheet. Um, but on the edges of, the, of Greenland, you see a lot more melt. This is due to global warming. Um, and as the ice warms, it flows quicker, and you thus get more icebergs uh, calving off the ice sheet and dropping into the, dropping into the ocean. 
This map, or the picture on the right, shows the Ilulisat Ice Fjord where we were, um, God, it's a couple years now, a um, couple years ago now. Um, so you see the ice sheets coming in off Greenland and then icebergs in the ocean. Um, the map on the right shows um, areas that will be affected by even just a few inches of sea level rise by 2050. Uh, most of the US coastline um, is affected, and this is roughly 40% of the population of the United States. But this doesn't just affect the coastal areas, since a lot of these people will have to move someplace when that land is lost. And so the red areas show most likely areas of migration uh, from this study. So most of the US is going to be impacted by sea level rise. And so just looking at Seattle, where I'm from, uh, the blue areas show areas that will be underwater. This is most of the industrial area of Seattle and the downtown. Um, another city we looked at was Boston. Um, most of Boston will be underwater by 2050. Um, so it's, it's a pretty, you know, the loss of sea ice, icebergs and the ice sheet is a, is a pretty big issue. Uh, this is a picture from the sea ice webcam um, in Barrow, Alaska. Each year, the, the town struggles to prevent flooding of the town. And this is true for a lot of towns in Barrow, or in the north, uh, up in Alaska in general, um, since most of the towns are built at sea level. The loss of sea ice um, allows the waves to surge up and batter the towns more. In the past, when sea ice was there, the, the, the sea ice would basically buffer and you know, dampen the waves, and so it wasn't a big issue. But with the loss of sea ice, you know, coastal erosion is a big issue, and many towns are already having to move. Oh. All right, so a lot of people ask me what I actually do for my current job, and I'm, I'm actually a Navy employee. And the, the US Navy, along with the US Air Force and the Army, uh, recently released Arctic Strategies. And one key underlying theme to all these strategies is uh, working with our international partners, our international allies and partners. Uh, we created this program, uh, Dr. Chris Bassler's in the audience, he was one of the key founders of this, called the International Cooperative Engagement Program for Polar Research. It's a mouthful, so we have a good acronym, like every good military uh, unit. So it's called ICE Paper, or ICE PPR. It's seven nations, you can see the flags there, US, Canada, all the Nordic nations, plus New Zealand, so we have a north and south component to this. Uh, we're looking at polar research and development to help address gaps in security, really. It's, it's not just a DOD, it's a whole of government approach. So we're working really close with NASA, National Science Foundation, NOAA, uh, Department of Energy, all the other agencies that Ignatius has already mentioned. Uh, some recent activities, you know, we talked about buoy drops, field camps, drone testing, and then this iceberg tagging experiment, or called ITEX, which is the how we got the data for size uh, second project. So if I didn't convince you yet to go to the Arctic with those kind of dreary pictures of Alaska, you're definitely gonna wanna go to the Arctic up in Greenland in the summertime. Uh, you get to hang out with a guy like this. The, go, go back and Google Einar Mikkelsen. Uh, this, this is the ship that we were on, the Danish uh, Navy ship. And uh, a fascinating story, a recent Netflix movie about him. He was marooned, him and one other partner uh, trying to map Northeast Greenland. Uh, back in the early 1900s. So uh, definitely take this one home with you. Uh, the logistics to get to Greenland was fascinating. So the smiley faces are where all the scientists uh, came from, Ignatius being one of them up in Seattle. We had some grad students in Colorado, uh, University of Kansas, uh, Cy and myself coming here from the DC area. You got to fly to Copenhagen first. We hopped in a uh, rental van or a van driven by my friend that I know with a trailer hauling all of our gear to drive to an Air Force base up in northern uh, Denmark uh, called uh, Aalborg. Uh, we got on that C-130 there. You see a picture of us in front of a, a military plane. We flew, uh, I had a, that was just a little stop for some coffee in uh, uh, Mestersvig, which is on the east coast of Greenland, which is uh, a fascinating area of Greenland that's very uh, desolate. Very, you know, Greenland's already desolate. There's only 50,000 people on the whole island. Mestervig usually has like three or four people there in the wintertime. So it's, it's one of the more desolate places of Greenland. You can see Cy there uh, walking back with our coffee because then we had to go fly over to the west coast of Greenland. 
uh, to get on a commercial plane to go to Asiat, Greenland, uh, where we got stuck there waiting for the ship for a few days. And then on the way home, remember, my, I never turned down a, a way south. Uh, the ship didn't drop us off in the same port where we were supposed to get dropped off, where our flight was leaving from, so we had to hop on a ferry with all of our stuff to get back and then basically do the, the same flight home. So, uh, you know, any 10-day expedition to Greenland takes usually about four or five days to get there and four or five days to get home. So you can think about the family uh, <laughs> love of that. But one of the great uh, rewards was, you can see us here having a, uh, a picnic dinner in uh, the New Haven, uh, New Harbor of uh, Copenhagen, and that's uh, Flekkestegg, which I would butcher in Danish, but it's this crispy pork sandwich that our friend Soren, who drove the van on the way up there, uh, his wife graciously made for us on the way home. So that's what it takes to get to Greenland. But it was, I promised everyone beautiful weather, and it was absolutely gorgeous weather. Uh, this was sponsored by the Office of Naval Research, this experiment. You can see one of size buoys that he's going to talk about there on the, on the bottom of one of these drones that one of Ignatius' students built. There's the Einar Mikkelsen the, in the center. That's the ship we were on with the iceberg in the background for some scale. Uh, I think that was us leaving the ship. That was the ship leaving up in the upper right, so we're pretty happy there trying to head home on our ferry. Uh, some great group photos of all the different uh, you know, universities that were present. If you look next to Ignatius and I, Ignatius is all the way on the right, I'm next to him. There's this beautiful little couple, uh, Bent, from the University of Copenhagen, whose uh, his research uh, assistant bailed on him, so he brought his wife with him uh, on this cruise, which was fascinating, and uh, she gladly gave up her uh, assistant duties to one of our grad students, I think, after the first day. Uh, <laughs> and he was, he was out there chipping iceberg, ice off of icebergs uh, from the little dinghy, so that was a, a great experience. But uh, you can see all the drones that we had on board. So these are all uh, unmanned vehicles that were deploying the buoys that uh, got Sai his data. And you can see a great picture of Sai there on the, on the back of the deck. That's what most of our days look like when we were getting ready to go fly and uh, collect data. Uh, so a pretty cool video that was shot. I think Ignatius has credit for this, but this is um, myself talking to one of the, the drone pilots. He, he def he's wearing those goggles because it was very bright out and it, it helped him fly. There's Sai on the deck rigging up his, uh, his instrument. This is the iceberg that we're going over to fly off of. We had two drones, so we had one drone using as the scout. You can see the ship probably about 100 or so yards away. And you can see the second drone coming in with the, um, with the sensor on it. And you can see it dropping there, it flies away. And the second drone kind of goes in to make sure that the sensor there is on the on the iceberg. So that's the sensor that Sai is going to talk about, and, and Justine is going to show how we visualized all of this here shortly. But again, if you don't want to go and see this in person, I don't know what wouldn't get you more excited. It's absolutely <laughs> fascinating, the icebergs, and, and especially when I can promise you sunny weather. So here's a, kind of a still of the drone. So that's, again, the, uh, the spider tag on the bottom of the drone. That's Sai's instrument. You see the smaller UAS. Ignatius like to fly and crash that one for us. <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> and off to the right. Uh, Wasn't supposed to come up. Yeah, we can tell you more stories <laughs> in the reception later about buying uh, propeller blades in, in Greenland. It's pretty fun. <laughs> but uh, Ignatius, why don't you tell about the, the, this is one of the plots that was given to us by the Coast Guard, who was the kind of end user of, of this data. Yeah, so, we, um, so we're, we were working with the International Ice Patrol, which the U.S. Coast Guard is a big part of, um, and we were test one of the, uses of this data is to test their models and hopefully improve it. And so the red dots are the drift of the, one of the icebergs. Um, actually, this is the iceberg that was in the previous video. Um, and then the green and blue tracks are predictions from two different models. Um, as you can see, the predictions don't line up with the red tracks in any, oh, and then the different uh, blue and green tracks are different days that they initialize the models. But at no time during this, um, this experiment did the predictions match the, um, <laughs> the actual drift of the iceberg. And part of the problem is a lot of the stuff we know about iceberg drift is from the Southern Ocean where the winds and ocean currents tend to go in the same direction. Um, but in the North Atlantic and Baffin Bay, they, they go in very different directions. And so one of the things we learned is that the models basically weight the winds much more than they should since 
a lot of the iceberg is, uh, the drift of the iceberg is controlled by the ocean currents. So one of the fun things about being an artist is that you get to define what your problems are or what your task is. And so I've um, appointed myself to be the special projects and prototyping um, department with Justine's help for the International Arctic Buoy Program. I've never actually asked Ignatius or John if that was <laughs> something that they wanted or needed. <laughs> but, but it's just kind of what I've been doing. So I took that same electronic circuit and then tried to modify it so that it could stick to an iceberg. This was my initial design. Uh, before I knew that it had to be dropped from the drone. I had this fantasy that the drone would sort of just like lay it down very gently. And then I made my first prototype, brought it to Alaska with John, and then John's like, okay, let's drop it from six feet. And then, of course, it broke in half when I dropped it from like two feet for the first go around. Um, but this is kind of what I do as an artist, or part of what um, my skill set is to kind of prototype these electronic devices. So this was the closer to the um, the final thing, so the idea was just to have these kind of ice axe-like um, claws that would maybe stick to the iceberg. I think there's a two-second video here. This is me practicing with my mock-up of the bottom of the drone. And then for some reason, John and Ignatius were busy when we had to go to the University of Kansas to work with the aero department. And so I went, and then I was the ad adult in the room <laughs> who was the only person that kind of knew what the full mission was. and. Um, we had brought in someone to train these pilots on the specific hardware, and then we got to actually go out. And so, of course, in Kansas, the, the natural thing to do would be to try to drop these tags on the hay bales at the, uh, at the uh, drone range or whatever, the, the kind of recreational airport. Um, yeah, so that was this, this kind of fun project that I did in the summer leading up to the trip. And my, basically, my goal is just to try to make myself useful uh, so that then I get to go on the ship with John and Ignatius. And so that was the, how I made these, um, these devices. And then this is the um, little bit of the data. And I think we will kind of turn it over to Justine to talk more about how that translated into art. <laughs> so. Um, our first work um, from the expedition in Disco Bay um, is titled the Iceberg Portraiture Series. So each drawing captures an individual iceberg as it was encountered truly a brief moment in time um, and then traces a longer period as the iceberg kind of moves through the ocean until it has either melted or the tracker has fallen off. Um, so the drawings are a composite of the data collected. They aim to reveal the process of constructing three-dimensional models and representations from field photography and hint at the limitations of fully knowing the forms of the icebergs or where they go. Um, so the two pieces of data we were working with um, were the GPS locations of the icebergs over time, which we could import into a geospatial software to map their journeys, um, and the field photography taken using digital cameras from aboard the ship, as well as aerially from the assistance of drones. Um, so these photos were imported into a photogrammetry software, amazing that some of you are working with that out here in the audience, um, called Capturing Reality. Uh, photogrammetry takes two-dimensional photos, analyzes them, and constructs a three-dimensional model composed of points and their corresponding pixel colors. Um, this model is called, this kind of model is called a point cloud. Um, although the detail is quite incredible, you can see a bit of patchiness um, where the limits of what can be constructed from the photographs are exposed. The white dots above and surround the iceberg represent the point in space where the photograph was taken. And so we wanted to bring these two data sets together um, within the drawings. And so with our drafting skills, um, we began to sketch through some ideas. This is a photo from my sketchbook during the early conversations um, when we were discussing how to bring the various elements of the expedition into the portraits. Part of our concept was to show the icebergs relationally, um, to be able to compare them at the same scale and recognize their different journeys throughout the bay. So to do this, we kept certain elements of the drawing consistent. The background map behind the drawings remains the same, as does the water line across the middle of the drawings. And so as we hardened the elements of each drawing, we were also processing and taking stock of the data we had for the many icebergs tagged. 
And so um, for Ignatius and his research team, part of post-processing the data from the field work was matching satellite photos taken from various satellites to the D GPS location transmits um, uh, to visually observe how the iceberg was changing over time. And so we had lots of conversations with Ignatius and his patient researcher, Ben Cohen, to decide which icebergs we would select for the exhibit. Uh, we worked through a process of scaling and composing the exports from capturing reality digitally, landing on a top view from above and a side view showing um, the icebergs in elevation. These kinds of representations are like quite typical in architectural drawings. And simultaneously, uh, we were running a number of tests using a large format printer at the University of Maryland. Um, this is actually a printer typically used for large scale signs but has become a useful tool for artists creating oh, sorry, um, large drawings across a variety of mediums. The ink is cured with UV light um, and allows you to print in uh, many, many layers. Um, and so after testing a number of materials, we decided to print on aluminum. And so the background of these drawings um, is, a, is actually a map printed in translucent black ink on that aluminum. We went with um, microwave data collected by satellite. This allowed us to show the landscape without presenting lines or divisions between water, ice, and land in a landscape that is always changing and always dynamic. Um, the ice moving around Disco Bay is also actually visible in this imagery. Um, the top and side view, I'm sorry, I keep pressing this accidentally. Um, the top and side view of the icebergs are printed like separately with a layer of opaque white ink and then another layer of color over that. And so looking more closely at them, um, one of the really striking things about the photogrammetry process and the limits of visual observations of the icebergs in the field is the difficulty of knowing what lies below the surface of the water. Um, and so we decided to use a different method, drawing by hand um, and a different medium, pastels, to speculate upon the underwater forms of those icebergs. Um, and this is also a useful image to see how we represented the GPS data, marking each transmit with a small white dot and annotating the point of the initial tag and the final transmit by hand. And we tried to scale those small dots similarly to the icebergs that you can see floating around the bay. And on the right, you can see where we've marked the dimension of the iceberg's height. Um, and on the left, you can see some of the outlines that Ben traced from, from that satellite imagery. Um, they are an approximation of the iceberg shape um, above the water with some of the perceivable shape below the surface marked in dashed line. And so at the bottom of each of the drawings, we've exposed a bit of the photogrammetry process to show the icebergs represented here as artifacts of this workflow. Um, you can see the iceberg in model form with a few of the field photo photographs expanded and a number of camera box outlines representing the point in space where the photos were taken as well as their direction. The hand drawing um, and annotations were the final layer of this multi-layered process. And in the gallery, the portraits can be read as an individual narrative about a specific iceberg. They can also be read as a collective and comparative data set. And when you look closely, you'll see the swirls of icebergs moving around the bay um, within the satellite imagery behind them. Um, the data from this exhibition um, you know, now makes up an archive of the movement and melting of ice, which we hope to continue making um, in building as we as we move forward so um, thank you very much back to you Jenny thank you retire that everybody thank you so much for that wonderful presentation I I, I do want to throw this open to questions from the audience and uh, uh, I do want to invite you to, to go to the mics again so that we can hear you and so that it's recorded for the um, people joining us through streaming. Uh, but I, I think one of the things that you talked about, and I, I will say this, probably one of the things that interested me most when Sai approached me was um, we see a lot of artists, a lot of data visualization um, designers uh, using data uh, for their artwork, and uh, but it's usually data that somebody else has gathered. You know, they, I'm not saying they didn't. They're using it without permission. They have permission, but it's somebody else's uh, process. And the fact that Sai, you, and Justine were so engaged in that process of, of not only 
helping collect the data and understanding that process of collecting the data, but you were actually designing the, the tools, which are, if you saw, I mean, they, they were just beautiful. They, I mean, I, we had actually talked about including some of the, uh, the tools as sculptures in the exhibit at one point. Uh, but I, I thought that that was um, a really interesting thing, and it's really set up the, I think, the, the really fascinating thing about this collaboration is, is how this is obviously a conversation that's going on, and that it's, it's the science that's informing the art, which in some ways has informed the science, and at least the way that uh, some people are thinking about it. And I wonder if y'all could talk a little bit about that, that sort of the dynamic. I mean, we, we often think that you know, the artists are in, in that spot from the standpoint of just pure outreach and communication, which is a, a perfectly wonderful uh, asset and a wonderful aspect of this. But I, I'd like to talk about that, the, the sort of the real dynamics of how these conversations happen. Obviously, you're all friends and that you have this like wonderful energy between you and it's extended out to other people that have collaborated with you uh, too. But I wonder if, if, if you could talk a little bit about that dynamic of that relationship and how uh, it's made, uh, I think Ignatius and I have talked about this and John, I'd love to hear from you about how these conversations make you think differently about your work and maybe even think differently about art and, and the way that we engage the public. No, don't everybody speak at once. Uh, yeah. I was just, I, I just love, I love Justine's comment of knowing that they wanted to display this, you know, before even going into the field. I think really it helped set the stage that there was a, this thought before even going there. And I'm sure it wasn't, the end goal wasn't what you originally thought, but there was always that thought in mind, so we had that in place. And then with Psy, we, we iterated through that, the Sea Cadet program I showed you, right? We had a buoy challenge of designs, which I don't think Psy took any of them, but at least he took inputs from these, you know, seeing the, you know, one kid, it was during COVID, they made a buoy that looked like a COVID, you know, virus thing, which was, you know, interesting. But um, even the, the, the collaboration at the level of how frequently we collected the data Right? Do we collect it every hour? Do we collect every three hours? Do we collect it once a day? And then thinking about what that would visualize as you know, later on was, was pretty important and, and kind of key along the way. So I think it, was, it, it definitely was always circular and, uh, you know, and definitely being you know, friends and colleagues with everyone you know, made it uh, much more personal. I think, I'm gonna jump in there for two seconds, but the, there's some serendipity just with the thing that John, I love that John showed the, the um, Naval Academy buoy pictures, because that was actually the thing that we bonded over when we first met, um, which was just the fact that we had both tried to, I mean, he had done this harder thing, which was try to herd a bunch of, of undergraduate midshipmen into making this buoy work with, with some help. And then I had been working on that project or like on that same problem. So I think we kind of had this, this initial thing of having gone through these struggles to try to create something that works in the Arctic. And there's just some kind of serendipity in the fact that I had been already messing with these buoys and, and kind of had some experience. I had to take a lot of, it took me like six months to make that then have a chance at holding up in the Arctic <laughs> and kind of redoing everything. But I think that there was some, just in the beginning, there was just a really nice kind of crossover of like shared experience. But um, And I think some some shared values are just the, the kind of enthusiasm for getting out there. Like you talk about how once you, once you go there, you just kind of want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty addicting. The, um, the, before I met Cy, I had some students working with Arduinos. Part of my job is to pay attention to all the new sensors and electronics available out there to build a weather station and stuff. And so I had students looking at this. And then, then I met Cy, I'm like, OK, this is just taking it <laughs> to a whole new level. Um, and Cy mentions that, um, that he just kind of does his own thing and that don't, we don't talk much necessarily. And, but it's just one of these things about like working with John and Justine and Cy is just we kind of just gel or you know, kind of know what each other need and, and just go and stuff. And so it's, um, it's a, you know, I'm, I'm just lucky enough to have a lot of people around me that, that are just wonderful. Um, and great to work with and, you know, help me get the things done that, that we need. And I, I think I'm going to 
<clears throat> Sai and I first met on this public sentiment project. He approached me and, and it was like, oh, I've read your book. <laughs> and, you know, that doesn't happen that often when you're in academia. <laughs> and, um, um, we immediately bonded over like um, our sort of shared experiences, um, experimenting with Arduinos and thinking about the ways that these um, new hardwares and softwares and possibility for being able to sense in real time um, environmental phenomena were totally changing the possibilities for designers. Um, and we, we also separately um, had um, Autodesk residencies. Um, Sai is an artist um, in residence in San Francisco and myself um, in Toronto. And so that was also you know, this shared background between working with a bunch of um, different fabrication methods of like 3D printing and different softwares and um, CNC printing with different materials. And so um, we, we really, I think, got super excited about, about being able to to produce these works um, together. And it's been totally fantastic, you know, learning from afar. I still have yet to go to the Arctic, um, what everybody has, has um, kind of gone through in order to make this possible. I have so many questions, audience who has a question. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Christy. I, thank you very much. Um, my name is Christy. I, um, my name is Christy. I, I'm an emergency manager. I'm also an adjunct professor for Georgetown University's emergency management program. And um, I've been in the Air National Guard for 22 years and I'm still, I have no intention of retiring anytime soon. So um, thank you very much for a wonderful panel and information. My question is, uh, with this art and science, um, how do we use this information to help citizens understand and planners understand uh, mitigation, the importance of mitigation and preparedness strategies and use that to create safer communities? Good question. I, I really wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> I think that that's something that we all, um, that is, like it was kind of neat to have this thread of the sea level rise come up and like it, we, we kind of, each independently made our, our PowerPoints and then shared together. And it was kind of interesting to see this thread of the sea level rise come up because it really is the opposite kind of end of the, of the ice that we're talking about in the Arctic. Um, and I, do, I think it is a, it's a difficult thing to communicate. I think that a really powerful experience I had was with actually sitting down with John Woods that first time and um, down in Virginia, and he showed me a version of the animation that Ignatius showed where you see all of the old ice exit the Arctic Ocean. And for me, that was a very profound thing where it, it made me realize that the climate had changed. And kind of before this moment in my life, I had thought about climate change as a thing in the future. And I think that maybe that's one of the, the things that the Arctic um, has to teach us is just this idea that the climate has already changed there and that it's not, it's not this issue of kind of what, it's still an issue of what will happen, but it's, it's a thing where the, um, that environment is radically different than the environment that existed sort of when I was born or when I was, um, when I was a, a child. So I think that that's kind of a, um, I think the more, the more we, obviously the more we can do to kind of tell that story is important. Yeah, and, um, you know, telling that story is a big part of our support, um, especially, you know, I talk about the Arctic Blue Program having strong interagency support and all the agencies um, support our outreach, especially the National Science Foundation where half our score is based on outreach and, you know, sharing our science through the public in various ways like the Stasser panel. Um, yeah, so we, you know, getting the word out there as much as we can in different ways is, you know, critical. You mentioned the National Guard and, you know, being from the Navy, uh, you know, probably the, the largest government agency on the coastlines uh, affected by sea level rise. You'll hear many admirals say, you know, why do we care about climate change? Why are we tracking climate change so closely? Um, Norfolk Naval Base, billions of dollars of infrastructure is going to be needed to, you can't tie an aircraft carrier up to a pier that's underwater. So that investment and knowing when we need to invest is, is one of the scary things inside of the Pentagon right now, besides having to you know, protect the homeland and, and protect ourselves from, from foreign, um, is that 
you know, the climate is changing, the sea level is rising, and getting a better understanding on when you know, they, they're gonna have to raise the piers and have that money to do that is, is, a, is a pretty significant task. Uh, and that's just one, right? You talk about hurricanes impacting, uh, you know, Air Force installations and things like that. So, yeah, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a global challenge and especially for infrastructure along the coastline. Well, I, you know, I had the experience as I was getting to know this work and getting to know and understand the way that um, the artists were looking and, and presenting the work and creating the work. And the idea, and especially I'm reminded of the earlier pieces that you had where you were translating a remote experience into the gallery space. And once I understood that and I started looking at the artwork differently, and it, it really changed my perception. I mean, like most people here, I haven't been to the ice. I haven't experienced that. So it is still just, you know, almost as, as uh, I've experienced the moon and Mars just as much as I've experienced that, that, that space, right? Um, and, and as you've indicated, it may be easier for me to go to the moon and the Mars than to get up up that way, but it's it's the fact that this work is having a, a sort of a physical, I'm having a physical response to this work. I'm experiencing something that I've never experienced. I'm understanding how dynamic the ice is and how it's changing and how it's moving, um, which, you know, I, I know that should have been obvious, but it wasn't because I haven't experienced it, you know. Uh, I see iceberg photos and all the time, so I, I imagine they're you know they're hanging around posing for photographs all the time. Uh, but you know, so I think, but I think that there's something in there to the answer to that question is that this by creating this experience is we're creating empathy, um, and I think that that's important. And uh, again, I think it's important for why we're here talking about it. So sorry to keep you waiting. Let's go over here. I like I like your voice. I wish I had a voice oh. like yours. <laughs> You'd make a great DJ. <laughs> My name's Todd Wiggins, and I just want to thank you, J.D. and Alana, for this great presentation. It's been a while since I've had an opportunity to enjoy what you've, you're offering. But um, I have two questions. One is kind of more along the lines of the military side, since you're associated with the Navy as well, um, Mr. Woods. And then I'd also like to ask a sort of more of an artsy slash... Um, mass marketing question. Is that okay? So the, the serious side, the, more, the, the military side, you started to allude to the situation with our coastline, uh, both east and west, and we being in D.C. certainly could be directly affected by that. Are we in the U.S. at a disadvantage relative to our Russian neighbors due to the placement of our major cities my understanding is because Moscow and St. Petersburg and some other are located more inland that Russia has a militarily has a, an advantage and then also with their activities on the um, in the north with icebreakers and so how did your buoys play into that and do they send out their own buoys that's number one then the, then the question about the art side leading to mass production I'm familiar with VizArts. I believe it's in Rockville. Um, if I miss that, I really want to go up and see that exhibit. But my question is, have you developed any products or do you see the spawning potentially of something that could be useful to the general public from your exper experiences of producing um, art, which oftentimes becomes more utilitarian and can be transferred into something that you and I can use every day? Sure, I guess that was the last last one. I think utilitarian's a, a tricky thing. Um, but I think that the like I, I've I think Justine and I have worked hard to try to be useful to the mission of this and that I, I have some pride as an artist that, that my data goes into the data set that Ignatius um, maintains. And so that's it's not the utility utility that you're talking about, but I think that that's something that's that's kind of important to me or has just been a nice part of that. And then I think I think the role of the artist is to 
to kind of make observations and to share that with the public. And so I think that, that maybe my utility as an artist is to try to, to raise awareness through creating these works or creating objects that, um, that can kind of communicate some of that experience of being there. But, but it's hard. I don't know how that translates into mass marketing. I think this is about as mass <laughs> of an audience as I've, <laughs> I've been engaged with. So, um, so I, don't, I don't have a kind of clear answer on that. I mean, I, I think it all depends on the, the opportunity and the sort of circumstances you're able to you know, participate in being able to, to like bring these things into being. But I certainly see um, you know, a huge expansion of the importance of like citizen science um, in understanding how our environments are changing from the landscape architecture perspective and my work with um, engineering with nature's um, sort of arm within the Army Corps of Engineers is um, and some of these, you know, sort of restoration programs around the U.S. is just, you know, we need a lot of information about how our landscapes and environments are changing in order to think about how best to adapt to climate change, um, how best to take care of our communities. Um, and so I think, you know, this type of work, its legibility, its accessibility could really have that mass market um, audience you're, you're thinking about. It's certainly needed. Um, and there are amazing nonprofits like Public Lab doing excellent work in this space. And so, you know, perhaps one day we'll contribute in that area, but um, yeah, we'll see. I was thinking maybe a new kind of ice cube tray or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before you go, one, one, thing that, um, one thing that came to mind is like a lot of these um, electronics that we use are getting cheap enough now that we could give these to, ki to kids and they could do citizens, well, not just kids, adults. Um, but they could build these weather stations pretty easily and deploy them you know, everywhere, whether it's here in the lower 48 or up on the sea ice of the Arctic, you know, from some town. Um, you know, so in that sense, you know, the, the, your basic Arduino is 50 bucks, you know, with all the sensors on it. And then the, the most expensive parts of the transmitter, um, but even that's coming down in price. So there's, you know, there's a lot of citizen science that can be done. I mean, a lot of like legal cases and social justice um, issues are won through um, being able to have data um, to sort of back up their cause and, and the need for funding and action in, I think, particular environments. So, yeah. I'm going to mostly sidestep your question so I don't get in trouble tomorrow at work from some admiral calling me saying, <laughs> what are you doing to talk about Russia? So, uh, but I guess from Ignatius's map, I think we're all moving to Oklahoma and Kansas, it looks like, from the <laughs> U.S. I'm not sure where, what the Russian map looks like. But uh, I would say before, before the invasion of Ukraine, we were working real close. I mean, Russia is part of the International Arctic Movie Program. So the Arctic has always been a, uh, a threat-free zone, you know, trying to keep it collaborative. They're part of the Arctic Council until, again, recently with Ukraine. So, uh, you know, hopefully world events will cool down eventually and we'll get back to that collaborative space. But the Arctic has always been considered a, a uh, you know, def uh, I wouldn't say defense-free zone, but a, a collaborative space and not a hostile space. So I'm hoping to keep that way. And like I said, they, they, are, they were close collaborators and, and want to come back in from a science community again. Yeah, the, um, the animation I showed at the start with all the buoy drift, um, quite a few of those buoys were deployed by the Arctic and Antarctic Research Institute in St. Petersburg, um, science institute um, that we've been working with for decades. And, um, you know, we bought some buoys for them to deploy um, in 2021, but after those get deployed, and they were, you know, just in October, just that after I at the end of that animation, a bunch of buoys, eight buoys popped up on the, on the Russian side, and we have 12 more that will hopefully get deployed next year. Um, but after that, you know, we're, we're um, barred from collaborating with Russia. Let's go on to our next question over on this side. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for making this open to public. Uh, this is the first time that I'm seeing in person people that have been to the Arctic. So thank you very much. I have seen them on screen, on TV, yeah. Um, I have three questions. One is uh, the sensors that you guys dropped on the iceberg, 
I'm kind of curious to know what is their lifetime and also if they were to hypothetically speaking fall in the water, would they, would they float or would they sink to the bottom? My other question is, um, well, we dump so much waste into oceans. Uh, most of it, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, goes to the seabed. But I don't know whether anything floats. If yes, would it flow all the way? Would it float all the way to the Arctic? If yes, did you see any trash uh, when you were there? My last question is: um, Do you have any plans to? I haven't seen the exhibition yet, but do you have any plans to take this exhibition and these kind of conversations? Because this is fascinating, amazing, uh, to high schools to inspire students to aspire to focus on interdisciplinary areas. Thank you. You want to talk or about the... Okay, I'll take first stab. <laughs> um, so your basic weather station is mostly plastic and electronics and lots of batteries, lots of batteries. And, um, and so our environmental impact is, uh, it, it's, it's up there. And it's, you know, it's something that we're constantly working on, like using, trying to use biodegradable plastics, um, improve, like you saw the buoy that uh, John's uh, midshipman built. There's a lot of solar panel, panels, so we're working, we're looking at renewables. Um, and then for this um, iceberg tagging experiment, you know, we, we have the electronics and the batteries, which we couldn't get away from, but we also tried to, you know, we, we deployed 50 tags on the icebergs, and most of these were actually, the, the tags are in wooden boxes with uh, biodegradable peanuts to cushion everything, and then and <laughs> John laughs at me for collecting rocks while we were out there in Asiat, and I spent a lot of time finding the right size rocks to put in these wooden boxes. And the idea was to, that you know, these things would sink and degrade with the environment um, after they were uh, tossed off the iceberg. I think that question of how long it lasts is really interesting. So yeah, we did decide to try to make things that would sink intentionally. Um, and I think in this, in this case, Ignatius, is, um, his devices were probably more environmentally friendly than mine <laughs> because he was using these, the boxes of the rocks. Um, but the, there is just a huge range. I think our longest one went for, it was like 90 days, 70 days or something? Like a, a few couple months. Ben? It, it traveled over a, th oh yeah, Ben, Ben, how long did it go? <laughs> there was one that went like six months. So it was just okay. But then some of the icebergs, like we, I was attracted to the beautiful icebergs, of course, being the artist there. And the beautiful icebergs are like all the ones about to crack in half and fall apart. And then those are the ones where the, like uh, our Danish iceberg scientist collaborator on the ship who would tell us which icebergs to take. He'd just be like, you guys are wasting your time. That thing's gonna be like turned over before, like as soon as the ship leaves. Um, so we would have this pretty radical range of like two days to two months. Um, and then there's a whole, I will not go into it, but there is like a whole, this um, gentleman that could read icebergs, like there's, there's a whole kind of language of what you see on the skin of the iceberg reveals to you where that has been and kind of whether it has rolled and all of these kind of different things. So it was kind of fun over our nine day voyage to kind of be able to then read the icebergs a little bit towards the end. But there's, but yeah, there's, they're basically all falling apart all of the time, but some of the ones that start out large and they call them tabular, so where they're kind of flat, then those can last for, for quite a while. Just one last, about the, the waste, and this is from the National Weather Service, this is not me, but the weather balloon launches, these happen twice a day, hundreds of airports around the, the, the globe, and there's some waste with that. It's mostly, they've downsized and made it really small, but they say the, protect, the data that you're getting from that for safety of flight, right? For global, th hundreds of thousands of people flying every day, the data that they're collecting is so important to help forecast the weather that that's sort of the trade-off. Obviously, we don't want to pollute the environment, but you also want to keep the thousands of people that are flying around the world every day safe. So sort of in the same vein with, with this data, you know, we, we try to be as, as smart as possible, uh, but we think that the data that we're collecting is hopefully helping, helping monitor the climate and, and, and save it in the future. Okay, so we're, we're starting to run out of time, and I see that we have three more questions out here in the audience. So let's, let's just be mindful that we wanna be concise and maybe uh, answer the questions 
uh, concisely as well. But let's let's start over here, if you don't mind, uh, telling us what your question is. Hi, Kayana, for tonight's presentation, bringing together the arts and sciences. Uh, I think science has to be objective, especially when you're collecting data or analyzing your data. But if there's one thing science can learn from art and from artists is it's okay to be human and be subjective, especially in an informal forum like this. So I would really like to hear each of the panelists' uh, subjective feelings towards this incredible place that is the Arctic, especially Ignatius, and uh, maybe the feelings you get when you look at some of the projections that you shared with us. Thank you. Thank you, good question. I've been going up to the Arctic since 1998. I had a short hiatus there because I had young kids and I wanted to stay home. Um, but yeah, I mean, as John mentioned, I've been up, we've been up there for multiple times each year for dozens of years. Um, and each time it's different. It's, you know, I, I learn new things scientifically, but also qualitatively, it's just, it's, it's beautiful. Um, and, and in an odd way, it's, it's, it's beautiful to experience the changes, but also kind of gut-wrenching. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's, yeah, it's a double-edged sword where you know, I try to be objective because like, if I wallow too long on the subjective side, I'd, I need a therapist. Um, but, but yeah, it's, um, yeah I, you know, I think of myself as a sea ice scientist, but now that I've seen icebergs up close and John's shaking his head at me, <laughs> I'm thinking, boy, this is a whole new world that I'd really like to learn more about. And it's just, you know, just one of those things. I, I'm lucky enough to have my job to, where I could be up there and learn things and see things. I think I've already said enough about, I think it's a, it's a drawing place, but I think the uniqueness is the remoteness and the, you know, we live in the mid latitudes here. Anyone can kind of hop a flight to go to the tropics very easily, but not many people can get up into the high Arctic, you know, at least they don't think they can easily. So I think that's what draws it, is that kind of remoteness and uh, the lack of access. I would just say that I would add that the, the sea ice um, is a kind of magical place to me because it's, it's this entire landscape that is constructed incredibly temporarily. And that when we go there with the, um, with the locals, that it's clear that they understand this place just like someone from Colorado understands valleys and mountains and streams and all of these things that are constant. And so it's almost like a, a chance for me to experience geologic time, but on this, in this course where over days it changes. And the, like Ignatius talked about how we'll be out there with the snow machines and then they'll be doing these things to like track whether or not we can get back. And that that landscape is actually changing right as you're experiencing it. So I think that there's this, um, you know, there's, there's this, like I can conceive of geologic time, but I can't experience geologic time. But I feel like that that sea ice landscape really to me is, is this way to kind of experience this like an analogous um, environment to that. And I've, I've spent most of my career thinking about um, landscape change and environmental change, looking both backwards and forwards into the future. And I think, you know, from the design side, always thinking 50 years ahead about, you know, all of this really um, sort of unbelievable change that we're supposed to expect with climate change. Um, it was a total reorientation to be receiving the data, you know, from a southerly perspective, um, you know, each day and actually, you know, processing both emotionally and, you know, graphically the changes that were taking place. And I was pretty stunned by um, how dramatic those changes were. And um, it was you know, such a different experience than I think a lot of the broader time scales we usually um, require in order to create a narrative about these, these places. <clears throat> to this uh, question here. Well, I wanna thank you very much for a wonderful panel discussion on this important issue. Uh, my name is Nancy Bridges, and I actually work with NOAA and the program over at the National Weather Service and NSEP on environmental prediction. 
And for the last couple of years in particular, I've worked very hard with the program on something called, people might not know, the high-performance supercomputer. And the high-performance supercomputer uses the very data from that network of buoys that you just discussed and other sources to tell us all about, you know, climate change. And so I just want to, you know, very proudly announce um, that this past July, we went live with a brand new system, which increases our ability to uh, make predictions about climate change three times what it was before. And we're continuing to make that. So you're gonna have more and more data for more and more of your art projects. Um, and uh, I think it's incredibly important. My mother was an artist. So, um, and my father was a scientist. So I guess that makes me able to say here that the intersection of that might raise public awareness on what's an incredibly important issue. That's it. Fantastic, That's what thank you. Say. Okay, um, if you don't mind, we'll go put this other question and then we'll let everybody have the, the final say here. Yeah, so uh, my, mine's not so much a question, but I, I'm really fascinated by this uh, idea of, um, most of my background has been in remote sensing and this idea of placing the sensor on the item. You're not remote, you're, you're actually on the thing that you're sensing, it's really interesting. And it makes me think of, um, you know, we've been having to think about healthcare so much over the last couple of years with COVID. And, um, and, and this idea of like, you know, measuring someone's heartbeat, their pulse, their, and, uh, and, and understanding their breathing. And, and, and I see the cycle that's happening here with the sea ice, and it just kind of connects in my mind this idea of like capturing the heartbeat or the pulse of, or the breathing of, uh, of this part of the world. And I just think that's really fascinating, and, and I'm looking forward to kind of taking part in the, in, in, of the, of the gallery upstairs, but I guess I was just wondering if you guys had thought about it like that, um, this analogy of like getting the heartbeat uh, of, of uh, these icebergs or the sea ice. And also um, this idea of, you know, you talked about how they flip over uh, some of the icebergs and they flip and, and you know, can, have you started to kind of understand like we have with the anatomy of, you know, conditions that might indicate these things are gonna be happening, right? And, and uh, that, you know, when we get to the point where we try to mitigate, like one of the other question, uh, questions was about mitigation, things we might do to prevent that in those situations where we need to do that. So um, anyway, that, that's my question. Yeah, I guess, yeah, one kind of quick thought I have is just that the, I see the role of the scientist is to use this broad swath of data to generate universals. And then I think that one of the, the kind of um, the opportunities as an artist is to use these same tools, these kind of instrumental tools or the sensor tools to then uh, thoroughly document the specific and the not universal. So I think that that's, like when you talk about this kind of like public health or kind of um, remote sensing satellite view and then there's this like ground truth or this heartbeat or something, then I think, I guess I, I think about the, the whole system in a similar way where I think there's like, there's a beauty in documenting like your son or your mother's heartbeat or something like that, but that that's um, meaningful information to the individual, but then we also need this kind of um, like world or kind of universal information to understand what's really happening out there. When, I, when you mentioned heartbeat, the first thing that came to mind was the waxing and waning of the Arctic ice sheets, and, and also the Antarctic. Um, but like in my animation, you see the ice extent shrinking and expanding each with the seasons. Um, and in some ways, you know, you, that heartbeat is kind of weakening in terms of like, you know, how much the ice extent retreats each summer and how how much farther it extends during the winter is just not as much. And so both during the winter and the summer, that, you know, that heartbeat is decreasing. Um, so. I'd love to show you, in the reception, we got some nice video of an iceberg rolling right next to us that uh, is fascinating. So gladly show you that. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep the audio down though, because there might've been some cursing, so. <laughs> Well, everyone, thank you so much for a, a wonderful, intimate conversation in such a big space. That's a hard thing to accomplish. Thank you all. So I'd like to invite everyone to the reception. Um, it is uh, the, the gallery, first of all, 
is out the door and up the stairs to the right. You can also access it, you see where those exit signs are in the back of this auditorium? That goes directly into the gallery space. So you could go either way. Uh, there's going to be refreshments served uh, in the Great Hall and in the gallery space. Um, I will also say that our, our panelists, uh, the tendency is for people to come up and want to talk to them here and then they miss the reception because they never get out of here. So I'm not saying don't talk to them, but I'm saying if you do talk to them, encourage them to walk with you to the reception <laughs> so that they can enjoy their work and talk to you outside. So thank you again. Uh, sure. sure.